Psalmist says in Psalm 138, I will praise you with my whole heart. Before the gods, I will sing praises to you. I will worship toward your holy temple and praise your name for your loving kindness and for your truth. I will worship toward your holy temple. The psalmist here is celebrating the fact that he is able to come into the presence of his God and to worship him. And that is what we are doing this Lord's Day as we continue to find ourselves in the precautionary era of COVID-19. And I think this is week number nine of government lockdown. And uh, we continue to worship our God in this way, in our households listening together. So we welcome you in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and greet you in our Savior's name to all our church members uh, here at Bethel and to any guests that are tuning in. We are grateful that we are able to worship our God in this way. And so may the Lord be pleased with the worship that we present before him. Let us begin with a silent prayer. This is a, a personal time of, of meditation, of reflection, as we calm and rest our hearts and minds as we enter into God's throne room. Let's pray. Amen. Our call to worship is from Psalm 100, Psalm 100, and uh, this is an important call to worship as we remember that the Lord, as our good shepherd, calls his sheep into his presence. Make a joyful shout to the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who has made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name. For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting and his truth endures to all generations. Dear friends, our help is in the name of the Lord, the maker of the heavens and the earth. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can come into your presence through and because of the work of our Savior, your Son, Jesus Christ. And so we pray that grace, peace, and mercy will be multiplied unto us as we look unto you in faith and hope and in love. In Jesus' name alone, amen. Our opening psalm of adoration is a favorite and a beloved one of ours, number 22D, 22D, the ends of all the earth shall hear, we will sing all four stanzas. Uh, we will be listening into a, a past recording of this, and this is one of uh, the tunes, the songs that we as a congregation, you can actually hear the different parts uh, coming together. So maybe sing the melody line or sing your favorite part at home, but let us unite our hearts and our voices together in praise to our God. Number 22D, 22D, the ends of all the earth shall hear.
In just a few moments, we're going to sing a hymn of confession. And uh, this hymn of confession, We Have Not Known Thee As We Ought, is an apt one to describe our situation each and every day, really each and every moment, that we have not loved and we do not love the Lord our God as we should. We do not love our neighbors as ourselves as we should. Um, the reality as sinners is that we have disordered loves, that our passions, our affections are often uh, disordered. We love maybe good things to love, but we love them more than we love God, or we love ourselves more than we love our neighbor or than we love God. And so this is an important hymn of confession as we acknowledge before our God that we have left things undone that we should have done. We have done things that we should have not, we should have refrained from doing. And so as we hear God's law in Exodus chapter 20, uh, God's law acts like a spiritual x-ray or a spiritual MRI, you could say. It reveals to us our sin. Now, this is not to leave us as sinners with a sense of hopelessness or despair, but rather it's to focus our thoughts away from ourselves and to look to Jesus, our mediator and our savior. And so the law in this way, with this function, shows us our need for Jesus. So here we have it, Exodus chapter 5, uh, sorry, Exodus chapter 20. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them, nor serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands, to those who love me and to those who keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work. You know your son, know your daughter, no, your male servant, no, your female servant, no, your cattle, no, your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God has given you. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor, you shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that is that belongs to your neighbor. And our Savior, our perfect Savior, uh, gave us a summary of this law. He said, you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, and with all of your strength. That is the first great commandment. And the second great commandment is similar to the first, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And so the fulfillment of the law is love, to love our God with everything we have, with everything who we are, and to love our neighbor as ourself. And so, congregation, let's now come before our God in this hymn of confession, stanzas 1, 3, and 4 of number 178, We Have Not Known Thee As We Ought. And let us sing this with a heart of contriteness and repentance and also with consecration to our God. We have not known thee as we ought, number 178.
Our short to part in is from Isaiah chapter 12. Isaiah 12, this hymn of praise to our God, the prophet Isaiah says, And in that day you will say, O Lord, I will praise you. Though you were angry with me, your anger is turned away, and you comfort me. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust, I will not be afraid. For Yah, the Lord, is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. Though you are angry with me, your anger is turned away, and you comfort me. That is the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. Uh, the Lord our God, who is a holy God, <laughs> uh, properly and rightfully is to be angry with us because of how we've offended him. We have committed cosmic treason against him. Um, but his anger is turned away, uh, not because of anything that we've done, uh, but rather because the anger was uh, put upon Jesus at the cross, that he was the propitiation for our sins, meaning that he absorbed God's wrath in our place and God's anger in our place. So rather than condemnation, we have comfort. And that's the good news of the salvation we have in Jesus Christ. So let us now have our morning congregational prayer as we come before our God. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this good news, this good news of salvation. We thank you that as your people that we might be able to as Isaiah says in Isaiah 12, that we will be able to, with joy, draw water from the wells of salvation. We thank you that this well of salvation is one that never dries, and it continues to give us your life-flowing river of water. We thank you for all that we have in you. We thank you that we can know you as our God, as our Savior, as our Master, and as our friend. Uh, we can know you as our Heavenly Father. And we acknowledge, Heavenly Father, uh, the words that we have just sung together. We have not known thee as we ought. We have not loved, learned of thy wisdom, grace, and power. The things of earth have filled our thought. The trifles of the passing hour have consumed us. Give us light, we pray, that we would be able to see, that we would seek to walk in the light of your truth and of your righteousness. Heavenly Father, we pray that you give us zeal. You give us ambition. You give us might that you would give us desire to honor you. And so we confess our sins. We confess our lovelessness. We confess our self-centeredness. We confess our lack of sacrifice for others. We acknowledge our, our lack of zeal for you. We acknowledge that we have done things, even this morning, that we should not have done. We have entertained thoughts in our imaginations and minds that were not godly and we pray that you would cleanse them by the power of Jesus' blood. We acknowledge that we have left things undone that we should do. There was maybe um, a compliment or a word of affirmation or encouragement that we should have given, but rather we gave a word of condemnation or of discouragement. And so we pray for the work of the Holy Spirit in us each and every day. We thank you for the continual and constant work of the Holy Spirit as he remakes us and remolds us into the image of Christ. And Heavenly Father, we acknowledge that this time at COVID-19, there might be certain sins that have been unexposed, that have been exposed because of the situation. Even as we must live in a closer quarters with one another, we are unable to leave our homes and go about our daily work and responsibilities like we are, are, have been used to. We realize that we have more friction with family members, with those whom we love the most and cherish the most. We've snapped back. We've been unpatient and unkind. And so we are grateful that these sins are able to be exposed and that we can repent from them. So we do repent from these uh, sins in our hearts, in our lives. And we do pray that you would continue to change us. Heavenly Father, we pray that we would be like-minded and sympathetic, that we would love one another in our homes, that we would grow in compassion and grace, that we would be quick to repent that we would be quick to say that we are sorry and that we would continue to uphold each other in uh, love and in and, um, and goodwill. Heavenly Father, we pray for our children uh, at this time as they are learning in their homes. We pray that they would be able to uh, be good students in these different circumstances, be with teachers, uh, teachers that are working with their students from a distance in these unusual circumstances, also for parents that are educating uh, at home, we pray that you would give them all that they need. And so we pray that our children would, would be respectable to their parents, that they would obey them in the Lord, and that they would grow in obedience. Heavenly Father, we also pray that you would 
be with uh, those that are involved in the work of uh, agriculture, whose calling and vocation uh, from you is to uh, multiply and to grow uh, vegetation and feed for animals uh, so that we might eat. And we are thankful for the work that they do and for this calling that they have to provide for their fellow man and food and nutrition. And we pray for them at this time, in this very busy time, uh, that you keep everyone safe in the fields, on the tractors, using big equipment, and that this would be a good uh, season of planting. Heavenly Father, we pray for a good, uh, a good year, that we would have a good yield of crops, that the, there would be a good balance of rain and of sunshine and of heat, and at the appropriate time, a good harvest will be able to be yielded. Heavenly Father, we do pray for our loved ones at this time. We pray for our sister, Mrs. Reineveld, as uh, at this time she continues to be uh, very weak and uh, as it appears that you will call her home soon, we thank you for the peace that she has. In, she has always had in life, but also now on the doorstep of death. And we thank you for her person and personality, for her ministry in our congregation, in her many friendships and deep friendships that she had with so many. We acknowledge that we will miss her dearly and deeply. And we pray that you would be with her family, with her children and grandchildren, great-grandchildren, as they uh, prepare to say goodbye. And we pray that you would receive her uh, into your presence at your appointed time. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you've been near to our sister Bernice Wood and that she's been able to return home and has recuperated so quickly and so remarkably well from the pneumonia that she suffered a week ago. And we pray that you would continue to strengthen her and that you'd be near unto her. We pray for all others that are uh, homebound in a, in a unique way because of a particular a vulnerability uh, to COVID-19. We pray that you would be with them and be with them in times of, of loneliness. Heavenly Father, we acknowledge that we are social creatures because you have made us this way. And so it's difficult to be by ourselves so often and so long. And we pray that you would dwell in us by your spirit. We pray that you would give us in this time of uh, COVID-19 measures a, an increased awareness of your presence. And we may we be able to turn our, sol our loneliness into solitude, into communion with you. We're thankful that you know the duration of this time. We acknowledge uh, how we can feel so impatient uh, with how long uh, things are being in lockdown, but you are the God who is omniscient. You know the end from the beginning, including this situation. We pray that you continue to give us grace in times of anxiety, that you would give us all that we need as we continue to seek to be a witness to our world, as we seek to, seek to be ambassadors for you at this time in this place. And so we ask for your help. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity that we have today to listen in uh, to the ministry of Reverend Harry Zeckfeld. We thank you for him and for uh, his ministry in Strathroy and that we can have this uh, virtual uh, pulpit exchange or virtual guest preaching by him today as we tune in to past services of his on the epistle of Jude and we pray that you'd be with us as we listen. We pray that our hearts and minds would be informed and that we would receive your word with hope and joy and love. And so we pray all these things, not that we deserve it, but because of what Jesus has done for us only. We pray this in his name alone. Amen. Our song, our hymn of preparation is number 200, sorry, number 529, 529 from the Trinity Psalter Hymnal. Lord, lead me, Lord, lead me in thy righteousness. This is a prayer asking the Lord to lead us in what is right and what is true, as we will think together about what it means to contend for the faith.
As mentioned in the congregational prayer, we will be having a virtual guest preacher today. Um, I guess you could also call this somewhat of a virtual pulpit exchange of sorts. Uh, usually the third Sunday of the month, uh, we as churches have pulpit exchanges, and because of the situation, we cannot do that regularly. So uh, several of our churches today are having these virtual guest preachers or uh, sharing of live stream services. So what we decided to do today uh, is to uh, patch in uh, two different uh, sermons from Reverend Harry Zeckfeld from the Providence United Reformed Church of Strathroy. Uh, Reverend Zeckfeld is well known uh, to us, and he's been doing a series of sermons on the Epistle of Jude. And so we're going to hear his first sermon, so the sermon that he uh, launched this uh, study uh, with, uh, Contending for the Faith, and this afternoon we're going to uh, listen, watch his third sermon. Um, and so you are invited to uh, watch and listen to the whole series of sermons. He's coming near to the completion of his study. But may the Lord, uh, by his spirit, instruct us today as we think to together of what it means to contend for the faith. And so now I hand it over to Reverend Zeckfeld. We'll read the entire epistle. Lord willing, spend a few weeks in it, but start this morning by focusing on our text, verses 1 through 4. I want to revisit verse 4 next week, but we need to get into verse 4 to explain why verse 3 is important. So I want to focus on verses 1 through 4 then this morning. Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are called, beloved in God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ, may mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain people have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were designated for this condemnation, ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. Now I want to remind you, although you once fully knew it, that Jesus, who saved a people out of the land of Egypt, notice that, who saved the people out of Egypt? Jesus. Jesus, who saved a people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. And the angels, who did not stay within their own position of authority, but left their proper dwelling, he has kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. Just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities, which likewise indulged in sexual immorality and pursued unnatural desire, serve as an example by undergoing a punishment of eternal fire. Yet in like manner, these people also relying on their dreams, defile the flesh, reject authority, and blaspheme the glorious ones. But when the archangel Michael contending with the devil, was disputing about the body of Moses, he did not presume to pronounce a blasphemous judgment, but said, The Lord rebuke you. But these people blaspheme all that they do not understand, and they are destroyed by all that they, like unreasoning animals, understand instinctively. Woe to them! For they walked in the way of Cain, and abandoned themselves for the sake of gain to Balaam's error and perished in Korah's rebellion. These are hidden reefs at your love feasts, as they feast with you without fear. Shepherds feeding themselves. Waterless clouds swept along my winds. Fruitless trees in late autumn, twice dead, uprooted. Wild waves of the sea, casting up the foam of their own shame. Wandering stars, for, the, for whom the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved forever. 
It was also about these that Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment on all and to convict all the ungodly of their deeds of ungodliness, all their deeds of ungodliness that they have committed in such an ungodly way and of all the harsh things that ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These are grumblers, malcontents, following their own sinful desires. They are loudmouthed boasters, showing favoritism to gain advantage. But you must remember, beloved, the predictions of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. They said to you, in the last time there will be scoffers following their own ungodly passions. It is these who cause divisions, worldly people devoid of the spirit. But you, beloved, building yourselves up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God. Keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. And have mercy on those who doubt. Save others by snatching them out of the fire. To others show mercy with fear, hating even the garment stained by the flesh. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. This is God's word. May he bless it. As you can see, there are a lot of things in this little book and a lot of explanation a lot of understanding is required, but Lord willing, with his help, we'll come to an understanding of this, this book and the Lord Jesus' promises and calling here. Brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ, a brother said to me this week, I'm looking forward to a series on Jude, but why did you pick Jude? Well, I like the book. It's little but mighty. It's short, and hopefully we'll make a good interlude. We'll see what the Lord's plans are for us as a congregation before we can meet together again. But like every book of the Bible, this book is important and necessary for the church and for every believer, each one of you. It's a call to contend for the faith. You'll notice that in verse 3. To contend for the faith. That's really the main theme of the book. And if you just look at verse 3, I appeal to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. That's the clear call, the theme of this book. And that's what I want to introduce this morning. It's a call to contend for the faith. And in an age where truth is rejected, it's really difficult for the church. And extremely important because the church is viewed not as the pillar and foundation of the truth. That's what the Bible calls it. But as a program of therapy. A retreat center for family and friends. A form of religious entertainment. And the idea of the church as a battleground for the truth. As a war zone for Christ. As the army of Christ. And his kingdom, to fight against the kingdom of Satan, that's almost lost in Western culture. And we need to revive that understanding that this is about fighting for the faith. Truth is important. It's all truth is connected to Jesus. Cut off the truth, you cut off the Christ. You can't have the one without the other. And it's the truth of Jesus that was being assaulted in the churches among the believers to whom Jude is writing. It's a call for every day. Contend for the faith. We want to see three things in this passage. This is a call to a protected people. Verses 1 and 2. This call is an urgent issue. Verse 3. It's a call that addresses an internal enemy. A protected people. It's a call to Christians who are kept for Christ, safeguarded by God. I want to look at two things here. The messenger, 
Jude, and the people to whom he's writing, the messenger, Jude. He's a servant of Jesus Christ and a brother of James. The Greek name is Judas. Not Judas Iscariot, who betrayed Jesus. There was another disciple, Judas, son of James. It's not him either, not one of the twelve. This is Jude, brother of James, a half-brother of Jesus. Jesus had four half-siblings who were biological children of Mary and Joseph. He was a biological son just of Mary, remember. This is one of those. We read that in, in Matthew 13, for example, where the people of Nazareth stare at Jesus in disbelief. Isn't this the carpenter's son? Isn't his mother Mary? Are not his brothers James and Joseph and Simon and Judas? That's Jude. Now these brothers have their own spiritual journey. You know that during the ministry of Jesus, they did not believe in their half-brother. They thought he was mentally deranged, says the Bible in one spot in Mark 3. But after the resurrection... They're transformed like the 12 or like the 11. From unbelief to faith. And James and Jude, at least those two brothers we read about, stand at the center of the mission of the church in the New Testament. For example, in that group of 120 in the upper room before the day of Pentecost, after Jesus ascended, Praying for the Holy Spirit to come down and empower them for witness. Who's gathered there? Listen to Acts 1.14. All these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer. Together with the women and Mary the mother of Jesus and his brothers. <laughs> Jude's in that crowd. Oh, here we find these brothers fully integrated into the life of the early church from the beginning. Jude as well. We don't know what station he held. We have an idea from 1 Corinthians that he was alongside the apostles, teaming up with them, going from place to place. But Jude, definitely like his brother James, who was martyred for his faith, head of the church of Jerusalem, Jude had a very important calling from Jesus, his half-brother in the early church. But he doesn't say, Jude, a half-brother of Jesus. <laughs> I'm pretty important. Like James, he introduces himself as a servant of Jesus Christ. He's my savior. I'm his servant. I'm his messenger. We also look at the people. We don't know who he's addressing specifically. This is one of what we call the Catholic epistles. It's universal. It's written apparently to believers everywhere. It appears that Jude writes after Peter. Peter announces that false prophets will come. Jude says, oh yes, and they're here now. That they're closely connected, these two books, especially 2 Peter 2 and Jude. You could compare them in your readings. Close connection. But he's called by Jesus, Jude is, to rouse the church to take action against heretics who have come in like savage wolves to destroy the flock by pulling them away from the truth as it is in Jesus. It's a serious business. So we don't know who they are specifically, but in a sense, we do know who they are. Look at how they're described. To those who are called, beloved in God the Father, and kept for Jesus Christ. They're the called, the loved, and the kept. That's the story of every believer. You are the called of God, the loved by God, and the kept for Christ. You're called. This is what we call the effectual call of the gospel. Jesus came to you with his word. Message of salvation. The forgiveness of all your sins through Christ's death on the cross and birth to new life through Jesus' resurrection from the tomb and safeguarding by Jesus 
all the way to glory. First Peter 2, you've been called out of darkness into his marvelous light. Called into light. Or 1 Corinthians 1, called into the fellowship of God's Son. Wow, to be called. Do you know that? Through the gospel, God calls you into fellowship with his son through the Spirit's work. Pray for that to happen in your life. Called, loved by God. Oh, to think about that. In love, God predestined us for adoption in Christ. That love began before time. In love, he sent his son. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be a propitiation for our sins, 1 John 4. In love for us, he sent his son. In love, he shields us and protects us. Nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. God's love is something that holds you. And it's a love that takes us all the way to glory. Oh, to be loved by God, to be under his favor. To be in his embrace. And that leads us to the third thing. Believers are the called ones. They're the loved ones. They're the kept ones. Kept by Jesus Christ or for Jesus Christ. But they're kept. As remember how the good shepherd, the father gave us to his son. And his son said, the father of all you've given me, I've lost one of them. We're shielded by the power of God through faith, the Bible says. No one can snatch you out of my hand, Jesus said, of his sheep. Kept. Wow. This book is a call to action. It's a call to contend for the faith. But it doesn't start with a command. Contend for the faith. It starts with a promise. You are called, you are loved, you are kept. And do you notice if you look ahead to Jude 24, it ends the same way? To him who is able to keep you. Our salvation and our security, brothers and sisters, does not lie in how hard we fight. Though we must fight the good fight of faith. Our security... Our guarantee is in the fact that God is holding on to us, loving us, and keeping us. You must fight for the truth. But what keeps you is that the truth is fighting for you. You must hold God's hand. But what keeps you is the hand of God that you're holding. Never put your confidence in your own action. Though God enlists you as a soldier in his army and calls you to action, but let your confidence always be in the strength of his mighty power and not in your own power and works. It's so easy for us to fall off on that side and, and lose our true assurance because then we're suddenly, instead of resting in our God for salvation, we're resting in ourselves. Don't rest in yourself. So the beginning the book ends of Jude, kept, able to keep you, keep those in view as we enter the battle zone here. And there's a lot of unpleasant battle in Jude. Oh, and then there's that confirmation uh, of God's grace in that, in that salutation. Verse 2, may grace or mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. Not may you multiply mercy, peace, and love, but may they be multiplied to you. In other words, and this is not a wish, it's a pronouncement. God will, by his grace, open up the storehouse of heaven in Christ and pour out upon you, dear believer, in the battle, all the mercy, peace, and love you need. Mercy is pity and compassion in your hour of trial. Peace is the assurance of his favor and acceptance of you in the battle. 
that you are his soldier. And love is that strength and embrace by which he holds on to you and supplies you fully. That's yours all the time. As the psalmist says, oh, how abundant is your goodness, which you have stored up for those who fear you and worked for those who take refuge in you. Let's always take refuge in our God and be assured that his mercy, peace, and love for, are for us through Jesus Christ, his son. Jesus purchased them. Okay, we need to move on to the second point. Contend for the faith as a protected people. Resting in God's protection of you. But contend for the faith as an urgent issue in the church. Although, verse 3, I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. There's a story here. Number one. This letter is a matter of reluctance for Jude. Uh, what I wanted to do and what I was eager to do is write you a letter about our common salvation. I wanted to explain with you and enjoy with you and adore with you and apply the teachings of the Christian faith. I wanted to write a book of Romans for you. A book about our common salvation. But something got in the way. Something diabolical and threatening to your faith and salvation has gotten in the way. And that's required a change of plans for me. I've had to switch gears. And what switched the gears? Verse 4. Certain people have crept in unnoticed. Ungodly people are perverting the grace. False teachers have come in. We'll get to that in a moment. But that's not what Jude's original plan was. Notice something about Jude. And should be true for every leader, every under shepherd of Jesus and every member of the church. We should not take pleasure in war. Jude is not a lover of controversy. He's not a contentious person who loves a good fight. He's eager to write about positive things. And he's only driven by necessity to write about negative things. But he has to and he will for Christ's sake. Our disposition ought to be positive and peaceful. And our eagerness ought to be for agreement. And walking together even when we differ. For charity. And to involve ourselves in a fight only when necessary. For the sake of the gospel. For the honor of Christ and the welfare of of people knowing that heresies are destructive because as I said earlier truth is tied to Jesus and when people try to sever that and say you can have Jesus without truth they're killing you they're killing you they're killing evangelism they're killing mission and they've got to be dealt with so it's a matter of reluctance. Secondly, it's a matter of necessity. It's what he says. I was eager to write to you about our common salvation, but I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith. When the truth is at stake, we should not declare a truce. And we go to battle not because we love to, but because we have to. It's a matter of necessity. It's an important calling in, in spite of the potential painful fallout. And that's what was going on in Jude's day. Unexpectedly, the church found itself in the heart of controversy, not over the color of paint to go on the walls of the building. But over the essence of the truth of God's grace that is in Jesus, we'll see as we go on. It's found in verse 4 to begin with. We can be so minded in our culture, in that message of tolerance that just oozes and makes people passive, the arm, the, the soldiers of Christ passive, that, it, that your job is just to get along with everybody. And, and, and you should be so concerned about winning people over that you're even willing to deny the truth of the gospel for it. That's not winning anybody over. Sometimes in our age of tolerance, we can 
nice our way right out of the kingdom. Now, this is a call to contend. It's a strongly worded letter against heretics. It does not pass the politeness test. I'll clue you in right now. It doesn't pass the politeness test. It's a matter of reluctance, this urgent issue. It's a matter of necessity. It's a matter of command. Contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. Contend means the word in Greek is agonize for the faith. Struggle, fight. Do a big workout for it. It, it points to pain, suffering, effort, to defend the truth, to contend for it, fight for it against those who deny it, who try to twist it, who reimagine it or reinterpret it, in any way try to pervert it. We must contend for the faith, it says. There's a definite article in front of faith, the faith. So it's not talking to be here about our personal faith, our act of believing, but the faith, the body of Christian truth taught in Scripture and handed down through the apostles, the, the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. Like Paul says in 1 Corinthians, I pass along to you what was delivered to me. The things of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised according to the Scriptures, right? Right? Contend. Romans 6 verse 17. You obeyed from the heart. That pattern of teaching handed down to you. Apostolic truth. The truth of all of scripture as it's tied to Jesus Christ. Brothers, this is an enduring call of the church. Especially to leaders. To be watchmen on the wall. Who sound the alarm against the enemies. And who are not found sleeping. When the enemies come within, especially the enemy within, to contend for the faith against heretics so that we can preserve the gospel and save lives. You want to talk about a virus that destroys false teaching. That is destructive. That's how Paul describes his fight against the Judaizers in the book of Galatians. They wanted to require the keeping of the ceremonial law in addition to faith in Jesus as the way to salvation. Talking about wrecking the edifice of the gospel by tossing in human works. Say you've got to believe in Jesus' works and you've got to add your own works. Destructive, Paul says in Galatians 2. To them, those teachers, false teachers, we didn't yield in submission even for one moment so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. It might be preserved for you. We fought for you. Brothers and sisters, we need to fight for one another. The leaders need to fight for you. We need to fight. We need to have our ears and eyes wide open against the enemy, and especially the enemy within. And that's what we see thirdly. It's an internal enemy. We'll just touch on that briefly now and hope to get more into what that looks like next week. But look at verse 4. For certain people, uh, we have to contend for the faith for this reason. That's what the four is about. For certain people have crept in unnoticed who long ago were designated for this condemnation. Ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only master and Lord Jesus Christ. Notice three things about these false teachers. They're unnoticed, they're ungodly, they're antichrist. They're unnoticed. They have crept in unnoticed they have sneaked in it wasn't obvious to anybody but the lord himself that their hearts were deceitful demonic and destructive they covered it over with nice words and and often that's the way it is we we can't see it ahead of time these people looked good they didn't have horns and red tails they were gifted teachers they were impressive in their style they were charming and winsome perhaps but they were frauds. They were frauds. 
Jude later calls them clouds without water. Clouds without water. That looks promising. Nothing coming from it. Nothing good. Remember that gifts without godliness are good for nothing. Can you remember that? I pray that you want to go into the ministry. I pray that you want to be a leader in the church, the el an elder, a deacon, a pastor. But gifts without godliness are good for nothing. These guys were gifted. But they were ungodly. So they were good for nothing. Worse than that. Destructive. Spurgeon said, Avowed atheists are not one-tenth as dangerous as those preachers who scatter doubt and stab at faith. Like, forget the new atheism crowd. Look at the ones within the evangelical church who are destroying truth by false teaching. Forget the ones on the outside. Look at the ones on the inside contend for the faith against them. It's not that we forget about them, but start with your own house. They were unnoticed. They were ungodly. They pervert the grace of God into sensuality. Sensuality, following your senses, your feelings, your desires, your lusts. That's how Peter describes them, following ungodly lusts. They were antinomians. If you're in Christ, you're free to sin, free to explore, sin boldly. God's grace will cover you abundantly. And they twisted scriptures to suit their own pleasures, like Joseph Smith twisted the Bible to defend his lust for polygamy. And like many teachers today, twist the Bible to support and defend practices of living together in sexual relations before you're married. People, churches defend that. It's fornication. Homosexuality, lesbianism. These are desires that need help. They need ministry. But to defend them, Biblically as honoring Christ and worthy of Christ. They were ungodly. They were following their own lusts. They were looking to cater to their own evil desires. And thirdly, they were anti-Christ. They pervert the grace of our God into sensuality. And they deny our only master and Lord Jesus Christ. They said they were Christ's. But by their lives and teachings, they showed they did not belong to him at all. They denied him. They denied his truth. They denied scripture. They denied his lordship. They were following themselves. Paul says, I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away disciples after them. That's Paul to the elders at Ephesus. From among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things. Therefore, he says, be alert. Remembering that for three years, I didn't cease night or day to admonish everyone with tears. Brothers and sisters, we who love Christ and believe the truth embodied in his teaching must have our eyes open toward false teachings, destructive heresies, and each one do our part. And contending for the faith once for all delivered to the saints. I have a thought for you. When you encounter something on YouTube or somewhere else that doesn't quite pass the smell test. Looks a little weird. Don't just go after the nice sound bites. The pleasant appealing looks. And the feel good message. Test it. That's how you can do your part in contending for the faith once for all delivered to the saints. Test it. Not because you love a fight, because you love the gospel. You love the truth as it is in Jesus. You love salvation, your own, your children's, the church's, the world's. That's why it matters. John MacArthur in his book, The Truth War, which is somewhat of a takeoff on, on the book of Jude, this book, The Truth War, he says, much of the visible church seems to think Christians are supposed to be at play rather than at war. And that's really true in our culture. 
Well, are we ready to obey this calling? It's part of the ministry of salvation. It's not against the ministry of salvation. It's part of the good shepherd's way of protecting his sheep against wolves who want to devour the flock. Who want to put out the light of the world, the church. And part of his ministry is to arouse us to contend for the faith. And that's one of the ways in which he keeps us. Fight the good fight of faith. Contend for the faith once for all delivered to the saints. But rest in the Christ who has fought for you in his battle with sin, the cross. And continues to fight for your safety all the way to heaven from, from his heavenly throne. And will keep you fight in his power and rest in in his faithfulness. Amen. Let's have a prayer of application. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this teaching and instruction that we were able to receive from our dear brother, Reverend Harry Zeifeld. We thank you for this clear teaching instruction from the book of Jude. And we pray that we would be zealous to contend for the faith. And we pray that we would be able to live out the application that Reverend Zeckfeld has given to us that we would be able to contend for the faith, but that we would not be overly contentious about the faith either, that we would have a spirit of, of love and the proper mixture of speaking the truth in love. Help us always to be a bold witness to our world, effective ambassadors for you. And so we thank you for all that you do for us and how you instruct us from your word. We pray this in Jesus' name alone. Amen. Our song of response is number 408, number 408, uh, for all the saints, for all the saints, as we together think about what it means to contend for the faith together. And so we acknowledge that we find ourselves always amidst a spiritual war. Uh, we find ourselves in the church militant here on earth. And so may we uh, properly uh, stand up for the Lord and acknowledge that he will indeed cause his church to persevere in the true faith. So number 408 for all the saints. We'll sing all the stanzas.
We now worship the Lord in the giving of his tithes and our offerings. Uh, the first offering is for our, the local ministry of our church. And the second offering is for, I'm, actually, I'm not sure what it is for. So it will be in your liturgy guide. And we uh, ask that you continue to uh, serve the Lord uh, in giving to the work of the kingdom, uh, either uh, uh, setting your money aside, checks aside, or also using the uh, medium that the deacons uh, worked hard to set up, and that is being able to do online giving in terms of e-transfers. And so you remember the uh, document that they prepared for you, giving instruction as to how to do that. And so may the Lord richly bless you as you give cheerfully and thankfully to the work of his church and of his kingdom. Our final song is our doxology, our final anthem of praise, and this is number 516, Hallelujah. We will sing all the stanzas of number 516, Hallelujah. Let us now close our time of worship in a final prayer, a prayer for the Lord's blessing. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your truth, for your righteousness, for your guidance, for your light, which is the light of life. And we pray that you be with us as we continue to enjoy the blessing of the Lord's day, that we are able to rest from our worry and from our work and to be fed from your word and to enjoy a time of Sabbath of rest. We pray that your grace, mercy, and peace will be multiplied unto us as we enjoy living for you. In Jesus' name alone, amen.